yes. So now guide me. What do we do here now? Do I, do we, why don't we just have a few moments? It was a retreat on silence, wasn't it? Your retreat this past weekend was on silence. So why don't we take a couple of minutes of silence and then just absorb what we just heard. Just take everything into silence. Take everything. Don't try to remember any point of the murli. Just go into your silence. And you remember a few, I think it was on Friday. It was Friday, I think. And Baba said, you know, just remember me as a point. And if you can't remember me as a point, remember me in the home and remember the light of the home. And so do that. Let's just go for two minutes and we will just be with Baba. And after two minutes, a point of the murli will naturally emerge out of that silence. And that's the point of the murli we need to nourish us today. And if I could remember that one point that emerged out of the silence of the soul, that will connect me to all the other points from the murli that I would need for today, for you, for to nurture me today. So let's do that just for two minutes or so. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. So now I would like to invite Niradidi, please. Can you share your words, some words of thanks and good wishes for us? Niradidi. Om Shanti. Good morning. Om Shanti, morning. Good morning. <laughs> First of all, happy Janvashtami. It's still Janvashtami in New York. For us, it's finished. <laughs> So it's like we are welcoming back home. You were here before. So it feels <laughs> like you have been here all the time. <laughs> so it's nice to have you. Uh, I think many of you know that uh, I know Gaitri Ben since 1977, when she was still a student in the college. <laughs> yes, Mir Ben, you were our teacher. <laughs> Mir Ben was our young teacher. Yes. We were we had very good timings with their whole family, <laughs> and now they all have become quite big, and they are like seniors to us. Love but it's nice family. to see Gayatri Ben growing and progressing and flourishing and glorifying Baba's name in the whole world. 
So just I was remembering, you know, recently Guyana had a reopening of the lighthouse. She had sent me some pictures and I was remembering my olden days in Peace Palace, <laughs> 77, when I arrived there and uh, all those wonderful days we spent with auntie, uncle and the whole family. So it was like, uh, for me, Guyana was the first foreign place, foreign service, and auntie, uncle were like my spiritual parents, especially auntie. She made me feel I belong there and gave such sustenance as a mother, even though Guyana is so far away, but I never felt that I missed India and the whole family actually. So those uh, childhood memories are very fresh, Gaiti Ben. <laughs> it's good to have you here once again. And maybe later on you can share with us some Avyak Parivar, <clears throat> especially I have been following what you are doing this week about Prakash Mani, that is reflection. Uh, it's very, very interesting. So you can share maybe a little bit about that apart from the topic uh, that would inspire many of us. And uh, also any news about Mohini Ben, anything about your self-effort. So you're most welcome to spend more time with the center of because we won't get this opportunity once again. And so thank you very much for giving your valuable time. Uh, I know we are all so busy in New York, so many things are happening. But uh, when I asked her immediately, she accepted. And so I was happy. And I'm sure all the Malaysia brothers and sisters have taken the maximum benefit. So thank you. And uh, we welcome you back once again. Uh, we will wait and see the drama. Thank you, Gaitu Ben, so much for being with us this morning and reading only for us. Thank you. Thank you. So we pleasure. have a song. We have a song and meditation before the other brothers and sisters leave. And before the other brothers and sisters leave, I just want to take this opportunity to wish you all a happy Independence Day and um, to celebrate your day of freedom. Um, at a country level, as a day of freedom, at a spiritual level, at the self level, because um, it obviously is reflecting something um, within ourselves. When we celebrate uh, the Independence Day of the country that we happen to be living in and we happen to be born in. And so I would ask you today, maybe at some point in time, to come together as a big family like this, or even within this song that we're going to be um, together um, holding in Baba's Remembrance, let us send some of our Baba's Remembrance Sakash, best wishes, pure feelings, love, to the Prime Minister, to the King, and to the whole country, and also to the environment of the country, to the elements of the country. And let's do that with a generous heart and an unlimited intellect. And it's as if Baba with us is embracing that country on the day of its freedom, on the day of its independence. So let's do that now.
So, Sister Gayatri, thank you again and welcome again, all Santawasis. So, we invite you to share with us on the topic True Freedom, as this is Malaysia's Independent Day, and as suggested by Mira Didi, whatever you like to share with us about New York, Avati Pariwa, or your now your current efforts, whatever it is, Hi. we would love to hear from you. And all of this, and I need to finish in 15 minutes. No, no, you can uh, take <laughs> half, half hour. Okay, you're going to have oh, to oh. signal me. Well, what I'll do, I'll share a little bit on freedom because it's Independence Day and um, it's a nice topic to talk on. And then maybe you ask me questions of what you want to know rather than me just rattling on. And, um, you know, it may not have relevance to where you're at. So I'd prefer, Celia, if you could facilitate a QA and a um, with the family. So maybe the first 15 minutes or so I'll share on freedom and then um, through freedom. And then we could do a question and answer and um, we could um, maybe fulfill the, um, uh, satisfy everyone by doing that. I was going to say fulfill the mandate, but then I'll sound like let you buy a sound as though I'm coming from the UN or from, you know, something. So we'll make, we fulfill everybody's um, whatever they may have in terms of um, wanting me to say. So when I was thinking of this word, um, you know, of this concept of freedom, I wasn't thinking about it in relation to your independence day, but I was thinking about it. Is there translations going on? Celia? Yes, yes, there is Tamil translation. Okay, because then I have to remind myself yeah. to go slow, right? Because um, otherwise it might be difficult for them to translate, but please ask them to indicate if I'm going too fast. So um, I was uh, not thinking about the subject in relation to your um, country's independence, but I was thinking about the subject more in relation to Babas Murli of today, in which he was talking about um, uh, a freedom, um, a liberation from our bondages. And I was also thinking about the freedom in relation to the, the question and answer that he asked us, in which he was asking us to have an unlimited intellect, a broad intellect. But he was also saying that if we were to keep some broader context of what he is telling us about, then when it comes to the actual personal application of the knowledge, because we have understood the broader context, like a history and geography, like the news of the whole world, like claiming our inheritance, our unlimited inheritance, those are broad context, the concepts he's talking about. But if we could understand that, then when it comes to us making our individual efforts, then it becomes a little bit for me personally easier because I am making my personal efforts within the context of a broader framework. And I'm not just making my efforts within the context of me and me and Bob and me, but he's also explaining things of a bigger nature to me. And when he says, you know, you have the knowledge of the creator and the creator is telling you about his creation I can't just focus on the creator only, but I equally have to focus on the creation that he is describing to me. So I look at freedom within this context. And this is why I love the concept of liberation in life, which I um, understand to be what we would call liberty here in the US. Now we have a statue of liberty and the statue of liberty carries a flame and that flame um, is a flame of freedom. Now, when we come to Baba, we connect to Baba as a flame. But when we connect to Baba, Shiv Baba as a flame, we equally connect to the flame of the Yajna. So we just don't connect to Shiv Baba, but we connect to the Yajna. He has created a Yajna. And we 
as Brahmins, we are protectors, guardians of this yagya. We are children of the yagya. So within this context, I wanted to open up my comments on, on this thing of freedom in life, in life. And I always start off first with the world. And maybe it's because I spend a lot of time thinking of Baba's knowledge within the context of the United Nations. So I always start off with the bigger picture. And then I try to, to narrow it down to the individual. And so when I think, when people in the world think about freedom, when, I mean, generally, when they people think about freedom, I think there are a number of freedoms that they think about, which is also um, connected to us spiritually, because each way the world thinks of freedom, there is a spiritual parallel to it. So the first freedom that people think about is a physical freedom, you know, the ability to move, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, freedom of this, freedom of that, freedom of body consciousness, then. That's how the world sees freedom in that physical sense. So that's one level of freedom that the world sees it, that no one should stop me from doing whatever I want to do, but in a very body conscious way. But that's not true freedom, is it? Because everything, freedom must be set within some sort of a context. The other freedom that people talk about in the world outside is the psychological freedom. And so within their psychological freedom, they would talk about things like freedom to have relationships. That's a big thing. Why should I have all relationships with Baba? I should have the freedom to have a relationship with whoever well, I want to have a relationship with. They have freedom to work. I should have the freedom. Uh, you know, there should be um, the governments, the community, the local uh, municipality should provide me um, with 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 an infrastructure, with with facilitate the process in which I have the freedom to work. I shouldn't ever be unemployed. The other, I think, it's a big thing from a psychological perspective, is the freedom to make my own decisions, and others should not be making my decisions for me. And another thing about psychological freedom is the freedom, mental freedom, the freedom to think. No one should take away that freedom of thought, the freedom to think. But then also, and this is again, um, connected to your country, it's political freedom. And for me, when I think of political freedom, I think of the freedom of the set within the context of human rights to have my human rights fulfilled. And the spiritual parallel there is of course, spiritual rights. And so when Baba talks about self-sovereignty, he talks about spiritual rights. When we talk about sovereignty of nation, we talk about human rights. But one of the most beautiful things about the human rights, is it's set within four freedoms. And the four freedoms of claiming my, my human rights, it's freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom of speech, and freedom of religion and belief. These are the four freedoms, freedom of worship or freedom of religion and belief. So for me, when I was looking at it within the context of freedom, I believe that we, we have to understand how this word, when we use this word freedom, even as Brahmins, how much are we still conditioned by how the world sees freedom? How much of what we are um, wanting from Baba is still very much influenced by the way we understood freedom in the world that we have been conditioned by? And so, um, you know, um, the, 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 the world, the context of the world is people are always looking to see that do they have the opportunity to speak? Do they have the opportunity to act? Do they have the opportunity to go in pursuit of happiness? Can they do all of those things that they call freedom? And what they're looking for is to make sure that they don't have any external restrictions to those opportunities 
So they're looking for a freedom of opportunities to do these things, whether it is physical, whether it is psychological, whether it is political, whatever it is, they're, they're fighting against things that would remove um, those restrictions for them claiming it. And one of the things that within this frame of freedom that we are facing is a contradiction of sorts. Because within the world of democracy, you would find that you have freedom fighters. They're fighting for their independence. They're fighting for what is right. And they would be upheld as great and brave warriors. But then there's another set of people that are called terrorists. And those terrorists are equally fighting for freedom. So we're living, but when you use the word freedom fighters, it is an acceptable term. When you use the word terrorists, it's a bad word. But when you're looking for what people want, I think fundamentally they're seeking freedom. And so I think freedom is a very important um, thing to look at. And this is why ultimately when we ask Daddy, Daddy Komarka, and that's tonight's Abhyakti Parivar, that who are the Brahma Kumaris? She says the Brahma Kumaris are people who walk around in one eye. There's the Brahma Kumaris walking around this world with liberation in one eye and liberation in life in the other eye. It's very important to us and liberation in life. And so um, I think I wanted to set that broad context in the world sense um, to see what we're dealing with and how when Baba says that liberation in life is to be liberated from bondages, what are those bondages he's talking about that we have to be liberated from to return to liberation and liberation in life? And I think the bondages that we have to, to liberate ourselves from are the bondages of the condition of how we understood freedom to be by the world. And I, that must have been for birth after birth after birth. So there are layers and layers and layers and layers of illusion of what freedom is inside of us. And that's the bondage we have to remove. We have to liberate ourselves from it. So, when we talk about um, spiritual freedom, I think um, I'm just going to give a few pointers and then um, I'll stop because spiritual freedom for me is a freedom from our karmic bondages. That is what liberation in life is. We, we are working with a process that Baba has introduced us to. To, liber to liberate ourselves from our karmic bondages. He calls it settlement of karmas. He calls it um, absolving ourselves of sins. Um, and the bondages of our vices and the bondages of our desires. So I think liberation in life is to liberate ourselves from these three things. Now, in principle, we'll accept, this is what I have to liberate myself from. But when he says to have a subtle intellect to understand what it is within karmic bondages, vices, and desires, three, it's like three pots in front of me that I have to liberate myself from. But then the intellect has got to help me do it. So what is the intellect going to understand that in this process of reclaiming my freedom, what it is I'm understanding? What is it the intellect is suffering from? Because the intellect has, is knotted up in a bondage. And the bondage that the intellect is experiencing is a bondage of blindness and deception. And that's what I have to liberate myself from to get liberation from these three parts of karmic accounts of vices and of desires, I have to liberate my intellect from the deception, the blindness of deception. And so um, 
I feel that, you know, they say, there's a saying in the world, and I, I, I know it's true for Brahmins, for Baba's children. And that is, um, every one of my freedoms could be taken away from me. God could maybe say that, you know, children, look, give up all your freedoms that you have been conditioned by the world with. And I want you to, to maintain one freedom. I will never take away this freedom from you. And that is the freedom. That is the freedom to choose. And so what is Baba asking us to choose? What is Baba asking the intellect to choose? Because the intellect, remember when we become Brahmins, we are given a grace gift by Baba. And that is the gift of a divine intellect. Now, if that's the gift God gives to us, that's the Gandiva, that's Arjuna's bow. I, the soul, I'm the archer, but my bow is my intellect, and the bow is the Gandiva, and the Gandiva could do all the miracles. It, it, it's supposed to remove all the evils. And so if I treat my intellect as Arjuna's Gandiva, then I will... Um, I will have this freedom to choose and the freedom of choice lies is the power of the intellect. So what am I going to choose to reclaim this liberation in life, this freedom that would lead me to liberation in life? And I feel that uh, it is uh, the freedom to choose is the freedom to choose my awareness based on Baba's knowledge. The, the intellect has to understand and experience Baba's knowledge so that it could choose the awareness that it needs to have. The second is the intellect needs to choose its attitude. These are choices that we can make to lead us to freedom, to lead us to liberation. It must, the intellect will choose the quality of its vision, its drishti, what it will see. And the intellect will choose the action it will take. And so before I even, for me, freedom lies in my power of choice, not in my power of decision making. So before I could make a decision, I have to choose the right awareness, the right attitude, the right vision, and then I will make the decision in, in relation to the action I want to take. So I was thinking of this um, as I was uh, churning on this freedom from bondage, because if we don't look at the, our entire being as a soul, and see, we are working with an alignment of soul consciousness, which is our awareness, our attitude, our vision, and our action. And when this is in alignment, when I choose the right awareness, the right um, attitude, the right vision, and I align them, then that liberates me from the bondage of an action. And that is what Baba wants us to have. And then, of course, um, the other aspect is having the yoga with Baba. It's how can I um, maintain um, remembrance? How could my awareness recall, remember that this being, Baba, is the one, if I have this connection with him, he would then be able, it's, you know what he said today in the Murli, it's only he can purify us. So if I have that connection, but not just an abstract connection of energy to energy, you know, this word energy, I don't like because I say, when I hear the word energy, it, it reminds me of something abstract. But when I hear the word life, when my life is connecting to Baba's life, then there's a purification process that is taking place there. And that purification process is removing from within me the illusions of Maya. 
Now that's another freedom that we need to look at. What are the illusions of Maya we're still carrying within us that is suppressing us from being our true selves? True freedom is to be my authentic self. So what are the layers of illusions that I'm carrying based on ignorance, based on what other people told me about myself? And I still believe them and it's suppressing my true self for me. So I can't have the true freedom to be because I'm still looking at myself through layers of illusions. And I think once we could do that through Baba's remembrance, through the love of Baba's remembrance, then we will be able to understand things like self-mastery, self-sovereignty, self-realization. And so I'll stop there and I, maybe you want to ask me questions, but as I was reading the Murli, and of course I read it a couple of times, these were things that kept um, coming back to me that I thought I'll share. Um, but I would like for, for to re-emphasize re, um, this beautiful um, freedom that is never ever taken away from us, not even by God. And that's the freedom to choose. But what am I choosing? That's the main thing. That's what I need to understand. Okay. So now you can ask me questions. Thank you, Sister Gayatri. That was beautiful. Um, I think there are a few questions. There are two questions already in the chat, but I have got one question myself. And I, I take that, uh, this opportunity to ask first. Um, just now, I like the point uh, Sister Gayatri mentioned that in Brahma Kumari, Srimad is our leader. And in the outside world, when there's a leader, there is a follower, and a follower normally loses his or her freedom to the leader, will obey, will follow whatever the leader, the leader directs. But in right. this case, when we follow Srimad, when we follow Baba, we, I, I kind of feel we are liberated. We are not fo uh, uh, followers in that sense. So perhaps you can explain to us a little bit deeper on this point that uh, Srimad is our leader and actually our leader here, I would say that Srimad is Baba. Baba gives you, how would we be liberated uh, when we follow, when we become, uh, we will be liberated, we'll be free uh, when we follow Srimad. Um, well, because um, we come into bondage following some other mat. The reason we came into bondage in the first place is we followed something that lured us into a trap. And, um, you know, the story about Sita was all about that, that she, she crossed the line of the code of conduct and then she became trapped. She was in bondage to Ravan. And so I think that uh, when Daddy Komarka said that this is a place where God is the only teacher, and God gives knowledge of the truth. God's teachings are teachings of the truth. And God not only gives truth, he just doesn't teach us, but he asks us to follow a set of code of conduct connected to that truth. Follow his shrimat, follow the directions that, in other words, apply the knowledge. Srimat is applied knowledge. You have to apply it in your life. Otherwise, there's no meaning and purpose to your life uh, spiritually. So if God's knowledge is truth, and God is saying to me that embedded in you is this knowledge, the knowledge that is in God is in souls, particularly Brahmin souls. When God tells us the knowledge and we take it into reflection, we are recalling the memory of what lies within us. And when that memory is recalled, when we remember it then, 
then God is saying, now apply it, follow my shrimat. And that is the process through which we get the liberation, because it is the following of the mat, the following of the direction that would liberate us from our ignorance. So the it, you see, it's, it's the intellect has become stoned, the intellect has become limited, the intellect has become um, totally um, in a state of it's called the blindness of deception. Those are the words I use. And so if we don't um, strengthen our intellect, we won't be able to follow the Srimat. And Baba always says the, the hand is Srimat. The intellect has to put the hand in that hand. The intellect would be the legs that would walk the path. And so I think that the, the point I'm making here is that if I want to become free, I have to follow a set of directions that will free me. But those directions cannot be connected to a human being. Because as you say, if I follow the directions from a human being, I'm giving up my freedom. If I follow the directions from my acquired personality from my acquired sense carries, I'm giving up my freedom. I'm choosing to do it. But if I follow Baba's directions based on Baba's teachings, which are the truth, then I'm reclaiming my freedom. It's as simple as that. Okay, thank you. That was beautiful. Um, there is a question here. Uh, what is spiritual freedom in terms of protecting the yak here, according to Srimad? What is spiritual freedom in terms of protecting the yak here? Uh, spiritual freedom in terms of protecting the yak here. So spiritual freedom in terms of protecting the yak here is I have to make sure that I do not become an obstacle in the yajna. So if I do not become an obstacle in the yajna, then I'm protecting it. So how do I make sure I don't become an obstacle? That is where the freedom comes in. So the spiritual freedom would be do I have thoughts that are creating a canopy of protection over the yajna? Or do I have thoughts that are throwing all the impurities into the yajna? If I have thoughts, like they say, you know, there was a war between uh, the rain and the fire in the forest when Arjuna was there. And Arjuna was called upon to make peace between the fire and the rain because the, there was, uh, the rain needed, the fire needed to burn the impurities and the rain, Indra, was putting out the fire, Agni. And then Arjuna was called upon to help. And so what Arjuna did is that he created a canopy of arrows and he protected the forest from the rain of Indra so the impurities could be burned. That's what we do is that freedom, spiritual freedom is to create thoughts and to have feelings in Baba's remembrance so that those pure thoughts and those elevated feelings create a canopy that protect the yajna from obstacles. And what I'm protecting the yajna from the obstacles of first and foremost are the obstacles that would come from me toward the yajna. And if I can do that, then I will become strong enough to protect the yajna from obstacles coming in from other people's thoughts. 
and their feelings, and of course, their words, and of course, their actions. And that is why for me, if I have to choose to be a protector of the yajna, and in saying, I want to be a protector of the yajna, what am I choosing? How am I choosing to protect this yajna? By fighting with everyone who's doing something I don't agree with through the yajna, which I tend to do sometimes? Or am I going to choose to have an awareness to have an attitude and to have a vision, these three in particular, toward the yagya that will protect it, that will create that canopy of my pure thoughts and pure feelings to protect the yagya. And I see this is the this is what the yagya needs today. It needs that level of protection from us. Thank you. Yeah, really, we are the protectors of the yeah, yeah. So we must not be obstacles to the yeah, yeah. Um, there are one or two more questions, um, but we also like to hear about uh, what is happening there in New York. Just very quickly, maybe shortly, uh, you could help to describe a subtle pradhan intellect. Someone is asking, describe uh, what is your description of a subtle pradhan intellect? Well, you know, um, I have a very dear spiritual friend um, and her name is Wadi. And I think a lot of you know Wadi. She lives in Miami. She is our area coordinator for the uh, that south area of the United States. And we were all, um, we were also spiritual friends of Daddy Janki. And so we were remembering Daddy Janki the other day, and Daddy Janki would be with thousands of people, right? Throughout the day, she would go to events and have thousands of people. But come night, she would gather up a small group in her room and she would talk to this small group. And we always said, you know, Daddy always saw us as her friends. And she would, no matter how many people she met, if she didn't meet that small group of us, if we were in Madhuban, it is as if she couldn't sleep. And so even if we were upstairs already in bed, she would call us and we would have to get out of bed and come down and be with her. Now, one in, in one of those small meetings of our spiritual friendship with Daddy Janki, she turned to Wadi and she says, Wadi, you have a Satupratan intellect. And I am looking at Wadi and I said, Daddy, in my mind, I'm saying, Daddy, you tell me that too. I would love for someone like you to tell me I have a Satupratan intellect. But you're telling Wadi, what is, what is it about her intellect that makes it Satu Pradhan and not mine? Later on, we did have a chit chat with her and ask her, well, what is, why is Wadi's intellect um, Satu Pradhan? And she says, a Satu Pradhan intellect is an intellect that is not a critical intellect. It doesn't look for reasons to criticize. A Satu Pradhan intellect it's not an intellect that would judge others. A Satu Pratan intellect would always see the good, what is best in others, would look for the specialty in others and would engage with them on the basis of that specialty. Now, if those of you who know Body, you would know that if you have a conversation with her, the next thing you know, you're telling her your whole life history and you don't know why you're telling her. She has this art of engaging you in a conversation so she could find out things about you that are your specialties, the things that make you special. And then she would engage with you at that level. So, you know, a Satu Pradhan intellect, of course, is a divine intellect, but a Satu Pradhan intellect as a Brahmin is someone who always look for the best in others. And um, was it Obadzali oh, Kumarka last night in which she was saying that one of the things when Baba taught them, brought them together as the divine unity group, one of the things he taught them to do was not to keep any weakness of another in their heart, which means don't let the weakness of another touch your heart. And secondly, which I found, this is a Satu Pradhan intellect, do not write a person's weakness on your intellect. Because if you write that weakness on your intellect, you've polluted your intellect. In other words, don't recall the memory of the weakness of the other. 
because that's what the intellect does. So that's what the Satupradan intellect is. And so she knows that I'm always one of justice. You know, this thing, uh, another thing about the Satupradan intellect, they always fighting for justice in the sense that they are creating enmity. Justice, you know, there's always a right and a wrong. But a Sato Pratan intellect would not look at justice and then try to look at what's right from the basis of justice. But a Sato Pratan intellect would look at love and then look at what's fair and equal and just from the basis of love. So a Sato Pratan intellect is justice comes from love. Love doesn't come from justice. And so that's how the Satu Pradhan intellect would work. And, you know, the daddies were embodiments of this Satu Pradhan intellect. So lovely. I can sit here and listen. <laughs> so nice. They are and number... Satu Pradhan, ultimately, oh, Celia, a Satu Pradhan intellect would find it very easy to love Baba. The preet in the buddhi, mm -hmm. the love in the intellect would automatically run toward Baba. And so it would be very easy for them to love Baba and for Baba to love them. Very nice, very nice. Well, I, I don't know about the timing. I would have to check with others. They, we like to hear uh, from near, you. Your it's near nine o'clock. <laughs> so maybe we we we'll finish at nine. What do everybody say? Let you buy Mira Didi, please, please, please let me know. I don't know whether we can go on because there are quite a number of questions here still. And also we'd like to hear about your personal efforts, about somebody asked about Aviati Pariva. We are really interested. There's so many good things coming out from that. So I don't know what, what time do we have? And, and uh, please let me know wherever it is and new questions coming in. What's the time now? It's nearly nine, eight minutes to nine according to my clock. Oh. I think until 9 o'clock we can go because they have to come back at 10 for another yeah, session. For another until question. 9. No, so she can share something about Avyak Parivar and her efforts. Two things. Uh, yeah, and maybe we will. We'll, yeah, like we can take the questions later. We can send these questions to her and she can okay. send the answer through email or WhatsApp. But personally, okay. she can okay. share her present effort. And Avya Parivar, uh, what they are doing, just uh, because a lot of us in Malaysia also follow the Avya Parivar, you know, in Asia, many countries follow Avya Parivar in different languages, and they will be interested in something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But what you are contributing to Avya Parivar this week, Gayatri Ben? <laughs> well, I am uh, contributing to Avya Parivar, um, Daddy G's. Um, uh, something about Daddy G. And um, of course, Avyakti Parivar is, I was talking to Sister Mohini today and um, Sister Mohini, I was saying to her, Sister Mohini, you are core to Avyakti Parivar in which if you weren't on Avyakti Parivar, then I don't think you would have people showing up every day. Um, you know, they usually have about 700 people on Zoom. And then, of course, uh, another number of them on YouTube. And so she is like very um, core to Avyakti Parivar. And so she kind of draws from some of us because Avyakti Parivar is actually a group of young people. Um, that um, it is actually doing the technical and the visuals. But um, Sister Mohini depends on some of us to help her with content. So when she calls on me, as you could see, they have these various clips of Daddy G, but there's a lot of visuals with it. And the younger generation, I suppose, because of the, um, the, the, the virtual um, ways of learning and learning from the internet, there are visual learners. But someone like me, uh, as Mira Ben said, you know, she met me since I was in, in 1977. So I came when Sister Janky came to Baba in 1975. But I'm of the generation in which I am more a conceptual learner. I'm not 
so much a visual learner. So sometimes I would be on Abhyakti Parivar and I would be talking and they would say, well, didn't you see the visual they showed? Um, it was not corresponding to what you were saying. And I said, I had no idea because I wasn't looking at the visual. I was talking about trying to explain what I was saying. So um, Sister Mohini then calls on those of us who are conceptual learning learners to help her with content in the Abhyakti Parivar. So Abhyakti Parivar is um, designed um, to like fulfill people who are visual learners, people who like music and entertainment, people who want to know core spirituality with Sister Mohini, and people who want a little bit more like my style. And so, um, you know, that's the context of Abhyakti Parivar. And they do have people coming in from a lot uh, different parts of the world. And because it provides such variety, I think a lot of people feel satisfied with it. And they feel they have they get something from it. So Sister Mooney would be very pleased that there's so much interest in it. And, um, you know, but now here's a caution. Abhyakti Parivar does not replace the local service and it shouldn't replace the local service because Baba centers are also very, very important. And so in America, for instance, because we still have the Delta variant and there's still limitations with COVID, with the pandemic, um, the majority of what we do is still on Zoom. But still, um, we, we tend to maintain, um, the local centers tend to sustain and maintain their groups of Brahmins because they do need that one-on-one -on -one and personal contact for sustenance as well. So this, this month, it was Daddy G's month, and they decided to have um, those clips from Daddy, the Jewel of Light. And then Sister Mohini asked me, because of my closeness to Daddy G, um, I mean, our whole family uh, uh, was very close to her. Um, that means my Lakhic family. And um, every time uh, it's her, it's, her day is coming up, it's like I relive that moment all over again in which I had to face the, um, that moment that she did leave the body. And um, it's still, you know, it's, it's still something like I lost. And so every time I do something for her in August, it's as though I kind of heal that loss that I feel, um, particularly when she left. And so um, Sister Moini knew that that was going on for me. And so she said, would you like to do something? And I said, yes. And then I said, what can I do that would be different? Because Daddy was actually a very, very amazing person um, in relation to uh, when Baba handed over that legacy to her. And um, so in 2002, we did um, an interview with her for the international, the UN um, conference on aging. So we wanted to bring the voices of women who were playing these um, upfront roles spiritually um, and we wanted to ask them questions in terms of how the world would understand how these Bra uh, Brahma Kumaris, um, women, spiritual women were um, thinking and how they were running this organization and how they were playing upfront roles. So we had like eight questions and we asked all three of the daddies. And then I decided to feature daddy Kumarka's answers to the questions. And, um, and so, of course, uh, the, the challenge I face in doing this is that how do you hold someone's attention? How do you hold the Abhyakti Parivar, um, uh, you know, audience um, attention um, to something so profoundly deep um, when they would have been exposed to all the singing and dancing and all of that. So that's, that's the, the challenge I face in giving, in sharing with them, because I don't think that, you know, it's doing justice for them to understand that even, to understand this part of her that was so profound. And um, I'll just share two bits um, of, uh, and it's called Living in Wisdom, Working in Partnership or Working in Cooperation. And one of the, you, you heard the leadership one in which she totally said she wasn't a leader and she wasn't, um, um, she wasn't accepting that title at all. 
Um, and then, you know, what she be, when, and then I asked myself the question, well, who is leading us? And then I said, Srimat is. And I think why that became very clear to me is because when we were working on the charter um, for the Brahma Kumaris functioning, global functioning, um, the, the charter is set within Srimat that we do not function outside of Srimat. Our entire functioning is done on the basis of Srimat. So the organization is led by Srimat and we as individuals are also led by Srimat. So our leader is Srimat, of course, Shri Baba. But there was another question that she was asked that I found fascinating. And that was equality between the brothers and sisters. And um, you would think daddy would go straight into saying that, you know, oh, I work, um, I see my brothers as equals. You know, you would think that she would go straight there. But what did she do? She explained what Baba explained to them first. So the first two, she says, Baba explained to us about Jagadamba. Baba explained to us the role of Mama. Explained why it was important for her to be upfront. Then Baba explained to us the role of the Shaktis and explain to us that when that the Shaktis were awakened, they would be the instruments to remove the impurities and the negativities of the world with their weapons, their spiritual weapons. So she set this context. And then she said, and then Baba put us to work with our brothers. And Baba told us that our brothers were Pandavs and our brothers were Mahavirs. So within that, she set the context for equality. The equality didn't come by her making an effort to be equal to the brothers, but the equality came from an inculcation, a dharna that was brought about by that deeper understanding of what Baba explained to them and the inculcation of it, the dharna of it, that resulted in her showing up with the presence that allowed for equality at the spiritual level. So with every one of her answers, it brought home to me very, very, very clearly that dharna is what makes something successful. If I don't have the dharna, my life wouldn't be successful. Knowledge in and of itself, without being inculcated, would not make me successful in something like equality, like spiritual equality. I would speak beautifully about it, but when it comes to interactions with my brothers, I would fall short because I don't have the dharma. So that was the lesson I learned in rereading this. Now, one of the, the beautiful things about it, this book I worked on, I interviewed, I transcribed, I got it edited, I did everything, but I didn't understand what she was saying then. Now that I am sharing it, it's only now it's hitting me what she said. So from 2002 to 2000, 2021, I never had the dharna of what she was saying. I didn't understood that it stood on dharna. Dharna was the foundation that, uh, that she worked with, and that was her success. Her dharna was her siddhi. Siddhi is the method that brings the success, and, and that was daddy. So yeah. And so, you know, every time that happens, and Mirabel knows how close I was, and Mirabel knows how much I cried she, when she, she left the body because we were all there. And so that hollow always comes back on the 25th of August. But then, you know, she would say, uh, Baba would say, well, you know, there's something you need to inculcate from her that she did that would um, turn that hollow around, turn that vacuum around. And I find that, I found the secret now. I found the secret. If I could inculcate these eight answers, maybe I would stop missing her in August. So that's Avyakti Parivar. And my efforts, very, very, um, I could share it with you all, is uh, mastering spiritual archery and understanding when Baba calls us Arjuna. 
And I want to become invincible like Arjuna. And I want my Gandiva, my intellect to be all that Baba asks of an intellect. And I want Baba to pull my thoughts, Baba to catch my thoughts, rather than me shooting it at him. So, because you know, um, you, you all did your silence retreat and you, why do we do silence retreat? Because we know the final question that the test paper is in one second, can I just be with Baba and no one else? That's why we do silence retreat, because that's the practice. Every silence retreat we do is to practice for that last test that we're going to have to face. And so that's my spiritual efforts now. And I'm calling it Arjuna's Arrows, but I'm really looking at this um, character that Baba wants us to be. And that character is called Arjuna. And today he's saying the Pandavas were not called Brahmins. Of course, they were called Kshatriyas. But we are the special Arjunas. Thank you, Gaitri Ben, for your honest sharing. And please convey our lots of love and remembrance to Mohini Ben. One of these days, uh, we would like to invite Mohini Ben to be in Asia. So please uh, pass on the message. <laughs> we will communicate with her. Uh -huh. She's always with Avyak Parivar. So one of the times she can be in the Asian Parivar also. Yeah. Oh, so lovely. We can see here whole morning, but it's also getting late for you. The guy tree is 9 p.m. there now. And we really, really appreciate so much. You've given us so much to think about so much of your wisdom, your insights and your time. We really appreciate, really appreciate so much, so much. Thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you. Thank you all for inviting me and including me. And Jyoti Bhai, hello, how are you? I'm looking at you. I could recognize some of you, some of the older ones and um, the golden ones. And uh, I know that um, being with all of you make me richer, make me stronger. And I could feel the love coming from all of your drishti. So thank you for that. Om Shanti. Thank you. Good night to you. Thank you so much. Good night.